Friday is Kaplan. Everybody's stoked and ready? Yeah. Gonna be ready? I'm gonna, sure, gonna be ready to read all that remediation. <laughs> Always. <Yeah. laughs> um, so it was asked you, what is the procedure for a Kaplan? So it'll be in the computer lab, just like any other test. Um, I think it's 75 questions. I'm saying I haven't looked at that one lately. Um, but remember, it's also you'll have the math portion after that. So you'll finish the OB Kaplan piece. Um, finish that and then there's a five question OB math. I don't grade that. It's not part of the Kaplan score that goes into your deal. It's just that refresher um, of math kind of thing. So when you fin like I said, when you finish your OB Kaplan, go back into the integrated um, exam section of Kaplan and you'll see the OB math pop up um, and you can take that one. Um, not that it matters, but do you know if any of these questions will be of like that new format? We got a, some of them last semester. Yeah, I okay. think they're still in the pilot piece. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, so you are, when I've watched the second levels okay. taking theirs, they get the next gen style questions okay. on their Kaplan's too. Right. Okay. So then once you're finished with the OB math and both of those are finished, you are free to begin spring break. So we won't have anything to follow. So once you finish, you'll just get to go. So, yay! yay. And what is the next gen questions? What is that? The case studies, right? What do they look like? They're yeah, <coughs> like the drop down boxes. They're just a little bit different style. Some were like case study. I think you had some on your fundamentals on the Kaplan exam. Okay. So that's what your NCLEX is going to look like when you guys take your actual NCLEX. So it's kind of embedding those throughout. So. Do we know what's the benchmark for the Kaplan? I haven't got that far yet. Okay. So, but I will. Once I, I haven't set it up in, in the Kaplan thing yet, so I'll get that. So I usually post that in the announcement so that you'll see what it is. Okay. So. Do you also post the remediation yeah. meeting? It's on the fourth. It's on the day by day. Yeah. Oh. So you actually get two weeks instead of the or yeah, two weeks. Yeah. So it's on the day by day thing. In red nonetheless. <laughs> All right. Any other questions that we move on to fees? None. All right. Okay. So hopefully I should maybe get through all three of these chapters um, today. If not, we'll just kind of keep rolling. Um, but we look at taking care of kids um, with alterations in intracranial regulation and neurological disorders. Um, also remember, and I do have it on the day by day as well, make sure you go back and review the growth and development because there will be questions of growth and development. So just kind of for every, or the next two exams, just make sure you go back and review, you know, What's expected? When kid, should kids walk? What, you know, just some of those things. Um, as you guys went through the presentations, oh, so long ago, beginning of the semester. Um, so, make sure you review those chapters. So, all right. So let's first start with kind of the variation. Let's do some quick little um, review of the A and P, the brain and spinal cord. Um, so when we think about an infection, trauma, really anything that's going to hinder the development um, during the um, prenatal period, the developmental period, is can and does have a, a drastic or does have an effect on that normal development. Um, we know at birth the cranial bones um, aren't well developed. Um, they shouldn't be fused together. Um, so there is a greater risk of fracture. They're very soft and malleable. Um, brain is extremely vascular, um, so increased risk for hemorrhage, so trauma. These kids are definitely increased risk of trauma. Um, the myelization uh, occurs in the cephalocaudal direction. What does that mean? I know we've talked about that. I've used that word before. The cephalocaudal direction, what does that mean? Top down. Top down. Head to tail. Exactly. Which means, when we think about that, so infants are able to control their head and neck before they can control the trunk um, and extremities. Um, and then we look at that proximal to distal to the center outward. So we're really looking at that cephalocaudal. And I know this isn't the most clear, but just kind of for that visual. So cephalocaudal, um, proximal to distal. So 
Um, so in our assessment, um, we've talked about before when you guys brought all the kids to, to school, we want to look at and ask, was there anything significant during mom's pregnancy? You know, was she exposed to tetragens? Was, you know, what was the growth during prenatal, you know, that prenatal development? Um, was she exposed to any infections? Things like that. So we want to be asking. Also asking about the history um, of the present illness. How long have they felt like this? When did the symptoms start? What have they done at home? You know, were they affected? Were they not? Um, so we want a little bit more information. Do I ask about any significant um, past medical history? How old was this child at birth? Were, were they premature? Were they the 26 weeker? Were they the 42 weeker? Um, because those are also going to have some bearing on this child's growth and the living, um, what they might be presenting with today. Uh, the type of delivery. Was it a forceps delivery? Was it a precept delivery? C-section? Um, getting some more information can be very valuable. Um, Infections during pregnancy, we talked about. So with the child, um, history of any nausea and vomiting, headaches, are they recurrent? What kind of headache? Um, visual disturbances with or without headaches, changes in gait. It's like how this kid is stumbling all the time. Many times we take a lot of that with kids, think, oh, it's just a growth spurt. They're just kind of clumsy. You know, they're growing so fast. Um, leg pain. We really discount that as parents. It's like, oh, you know, they're just growing and they're having those, you know, growing pains. But is it really just growing pains? Or is there some underlying um, disease process that's happening that we're just kind of discounting um, as, yeah, it's normal. So we wouldn't be asking about any of these changes. Um, definitely recent trauma, even if it seems not very significant. Um, Asking about family history from genetic disorders, neurological um, manifestations. Is there a history of seizures in their family? Um, if that's what they're maybe presenting with, because we have seen some genetic predisposition to that as well, um, as well as headaches. So with our health history, again, kind of looking at a lot of stuff that I just talked about. I mean, I really like that, just put it in a different format. But noting any um, delays in their growth and development, so that little growth chart. Well, it's not just because we like to do charts. We're really looking at that visual. Is this kiddo, you know, they're growing really well, and then they kind of plateau when they were seven, which is a little early. Or do we see, you know, a significant change? So those are things we're really looking at. Um, ingestion of anything that's toxic, um, pain, fever, things like that. Um, in our physical exam, um, definitely things we're looking at, level of consciousness. Why is level of consciousness so important? Because of neurological function. It does. So it's a neurological function. And that is really one of those very subtle signs that is so important because it tells us either this child is improving or we're starting to see that decline. So subtle changes in that level of consciousness are huge red flags. They're like, mm. <laughs> This kid was wide awake, now they're starting to drift off. Um, yes, they may just be sleepy, but they're more difficult to arouse now. They weren't before. So those are things we really want to be making um, note of. Definitely the vital signs. Another thing I would um, make sure you know, this is a great flashcard, normal vital signs for each age group, because you will have questions on the exam that give you the child's um, vital signs. You'll need to know if this expected or unexpected. Does this signify something I need to pay attention to? Um, so make sure you look at those. Um, I really like the handout that you got from Children's. Um, we have, they have that at the back of that little booklet um, from the handout, or the whatever that thing is, um, as, a, as a reference point. Um, cranial nerve function, we like the fundamentals, <coughs> remembering um, the different cranial nerves and how we're testing. Um, we look at their motor function. This is that child with their being, you know, walking in um, for their appointment. Watch their gait as they're coming in. Are they stumbling and falling? It could just be they're kind of clumsy and they're in that awkward, you know, stage of growth. But I, do I notice a limp? Um, do I notice anything unusual? Um, with infants and toddlers, um, look at that motor function as well. 
um, are they moving symmetrically? Um, their reflexes, we'll be assessing their reflexes, sensory functions, and then assessing for increase in cardio pressure. We'll talk more as we go through how we're um, assessing that and what that might be indicative of. So with level of consciousness, as I mentioned, the earliest indicator of either improvement or deterioration of a child um, in our neural status, and even in adults, it's a huge thing. These are terms in full consciousness, confusion, of tunded, stupor, and coma. Guarantee you have to know those. Guarantee you'll see that on the exam. Um, great flashcards to put in. Um, when you're charting, you want to make sure you're charting the right using the right term. I was trying to be all creative so I put a spin on there. I was very clever. But anyway, that's as clever as it got. All right, last of the scale. I, I didn't, I don't think I put a spin on this one. Nope. Again, you have to know this one. I guarantee you're also going to see, much like the APGAR, you will have the case study. You'll have to figure out what is our last of the scale. What does it indicate? So we have a different one from adults to children, um, and even our infants. So we'll look at with our um, less than a year on our infants. When we look at the total score, best score, 15. I think we're all roughly at a 15, maybe a 13, you know, depending right after lunch. Um, <laughs> or a four, hopefully not a four. You guys are somewhat responsive. Um, come and tell us less than eight. <laughs> Why do you say it? Don't touch me. He's a four, so I want to imitate him. <laughs> Less than eight into bait? Yeah. <laughs> Less than eight. But, okay. Anyway, so make sure you're reviewing. So we look at you know, their behavior, their eye opening. You know, do they, what does it take to get them to open their eyes? <clears throat> they open spontaneously, or they have their eyes closed as I talk to them, and they open their eyes. Do I have to do some elicit some kind of painful response, whether it's a sternal rub um, or you know, using a pen or something to elicit um, pain to get them to open their eyes, or no matter what I do, they don't open their eyes. Um, verbal response, um, are they oriented to their AAO times three or times four, depending on their age? Are they confused? No clue <clears throat> who anybody is, where they are. Um, inappropriate words, nothing's really making sense. They're just kind of garbled, which kind of us at the end of the day is that incomprehensible sounds um, or no response. And then their motor response. Can they you know, lift their left arm? Can they you know, basically obey commands? Um, moving to pain, um, they flex um, to withdraw from pain, abnormal flexion or extension, and then no response. So again, this is something I want you to really pay attention to and being able to score out um, your patient. And what does it mean? You know, if they have a, a 15, we're good. If they have a three, probably not so good, right? Right. Yeah. Not, not really chance of a good outcome, possibly. And then again, just a difference. All right. All right, head, neck, um, head, face, and neck. So we're inspecting, so this is going back to your head to toe assessment, looking at size and shape, looking at their face for symmetry, anything um, unusual, their range of neck, uh, motion of their neck. When we get to less than three, we know that we need to be doing that head circumference measurement. Um, and especially any child whose head size is questionable. So it's like, hmm, they kind of look like they have a, an unusually large head. We want to make sure we document that because we're going to be following up. Why is this happening? Anything unusual? Same with a smaller um, than normal head size, um, because we know this might indicate microcephaly. Um, we know that larger than normal um, can indicate hydrocephaly. Um, so cranial nerve functions are three, four, and six. Um, using the doll's eye maneuver to evaluate those um, cranial nerves. So with this, um, we can use for an infant comatose child or an uncooperative child. So if anybody that remembers, you know, looking at a doll, if you, I know I was trying to get, we had one here, but basically the normal movement is if you turn their head to the left, their eyes should still try and stay, stay to the center. So when you turn your head this way, instead of following the movement, 
their eyes should stay, should move to the center. Um, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, if we don't see that, it indicates, indicates increased intracranial pressure. This is another, I know I had, this morning I was reviewing this and I was like, mm -hmm. it was really hard to make my eyes stay forward. <laughs> Good thing nobody was up when I was doing this, watching my <laughs> finger movements. <laughs> um, but the key takeaway I want to highlight is one, knowing what we're looking for, and if they don't do this, it might indicate an increase in intracranial pressure. Um, and that's one of those really important things. What nerve is being compressed um, that's causing that from happening? Or to happen? And this is basically what we're, we're seeing. So if they, if the listens is as normal, we know that brainstem is intact. If it isn't, there's something that's being compressed or is being affected. Uh, ocular motor function, it's observing for nystagmus. What is that? Involuntary twitching. Exactly, their eyeballs are kind of twitching. Exactly. So horizontal nystagmus can happen with lesions in the brainstem um, and medications such as phenotonin. What's phenotonin? Anticonvulsant. What's that? Anticonvulsant. Anticonvulsant. All right. I will tell Miss Angie. She's going to sit down. Thank <laughs> Good you, Ashley. <laughs> uh, vertical nystagmus indicates brainstem dysfunction. Um, sunsetting eyes. This is when we tend to see the sclera is showing over the top of the iris. Again, indicates increased intracranial pressure. This isn't the greatest picture. But basically what yes, we're seeing. Is. <laughs> <laughs> is that spinning around? Yeah. Well, it's showing the increased, you know, circumference and you know, whatnot. But the sun setting is that you can see more of the, the sclera um, of their eyes. Um, so we kind of tend to see that. Um, and then the pupillary response is often abnormal anytime we have a patient has neurological um, deficits or disorders. And maybe their head spinning around, I don't know. All right, motor functions. So again, we're looking at muscle strength, size, um, tone, even in our infants um, and our children. We're assessing bilaterally. So are they moving equally? Unless they have a fracture, and that's also telling us, hmm, something's unusual. We're looking at their activity, their posture, their balance. Um, again, looking for asymmetry in those movements. Alteration in their gait, muscle tone, um, may tell us that something else is going on neurologically. Uh, again, increased intracranial pressure, um, head trauma, um, and even cerebral infections. So we're looking for the corticate posturing, which we know tells us that there's damage to uh, the cerebral cortex. <coughs> what is the corticate versus the cerebral posturing? Which is the corticate? They're coming to the core. They're Flexed up, they're coming to the core. Versus the cerebrate, they're more extended. And many times you'll see with their palms out uh, for the cerebrate. Both of these are very rigid muscle tone um, with either one. And so this is kind of what we're seeing with the cerebral cortex damage with the corticate and brainstem damage um, with the cerebrate damage. So reflexes, so we're still testing um, deep tendon reflexes, part of our neuroassessment. Um, we know the infants um, are more primitive and more protective reflexes, much as we saw in your um, demonstrations we did a few weeks ago. Um, sensory function, kids are, really should be able to, to distinguish between light, touch, pain, vibration, heat, and cold. With the infant, we're really more limiting that to just touch um, and maybe pain, pain sensation. Are not able to discern you know, heat, cold, vibration. 
Uh, with increased intracranial pressure, it can happen from head trauma, birth trauma, which is why it's really important we ask about um, the birth history, um, hydrocephalus, infection, and brain tumors. Um, when we think of head trauma, what are some of the causes of head trauma? Fall. What age group is probably most likely to have issues with head trauma? Toddlers. Toddlers. Too late. Typically, they're toddlers. Um, I guess that was a loaded question. That wasn't the most fair. But toddlers, because their head is a little bit bigger, they tend to topple over a little bit easier. Um, so besides falling, what other things can cause head trauma? Vehicle accidents. Oh, and disease. Okay. Trauma. Abuse. Uh, what kind of abuse? Emotional. <laughs> Emotional. Probably <laughs> not in this case. Shaken baby syndrome. Oh, so we yes. think of infants and, and even toddlers. I didn't think you can shake your toddler. <laughs> you can. Uh, it's, um, so, and that's, I guess, you know, when we think of the mandatory reporting that you guys all did that by your certification, shaken baby syndrome is, is a real thing. Um, I think I'm still have the emotional trauma um, and scars. We went two years ago. Um, they had this guy from Canada. He was like some whatever policeman and did a two day presentation on child abuse and shaken baby syndrome. And the videos that he showed and the demonstrations were, were something I will never ever forget. There was one case, um, it was a lady who was, I think babysitting this little like about this old, you know, two, maybe year old child. Anyway, she would leave to take her child to the bus stop. And when she came back, her boyfriend was staying with the child she was babysitting. Um, and she just thought it was really odd that every time she came back, this child was just acting really different. So she set up a baby cam, which I thought was very ingenious of her. Set up the baby cam, went through her normal routine. And when she came back and watched that, it was, it was just horrific. Again, it's just like emotionally even thinking about it. But he would um, grab the baby. So the baby would, of course, the child would, you know, reach for, for him. And he would grab the kid, slam it down in the, in the crib, and do this over and over. And at one point in there, he actually jabbed the child in the eyes with his finger and knocked it down. And so, I mean, he is now in prison. Um, but it was just like, wow. And I think there was some, you know, the shaking and the whole thing. And then just the experiments that they would, you know, he explained about how they would do like with monkeys and just kind of to see what total damage could be done with that whole shaken baby, you know, it's, again, that mandatory report, anytime something seems weird, we definitely want to report it because that's, it's just, I can't imagine, you know, what that, that woman went through not knowing this is happening and then finding out what was going on all this time that she was, was gone. Um, so, so we definitely want to think about <clears throat> what's happening with that because they're, when we think of shaken baby, it's that coop, contra coop. So they're getting a lot of, of damage. So it's the brain sloshing forward, hitting the, the frontal bone, and then also as it goes back. So we're seeing damage both, you know, front and back of the brain. The, the shearing and the tearing. So we look at the potential for hemorrhage, you know, that bleeding tendency. So all of those you know, symptoms we'll talk more about of increased intracranial pressure. How can they, excuse me, how can they happen? What is that, that child presenting with? Um, with um, an increase in intracranial pressure, we know that there's a um, level of consciousness decreases. That's why it's so important we have our baseline. And then that's telling us, is this child getting worse or are they getting better as we see those, those changes um, in that level of consciousness? Um, so it's really, really, really important that we recognize those signs. Yes, it's important for the exam, super important in the day-to-day -day interaction with your patients. Being able to hone in on those subtle little changes um, because it can go from you know, long-term damage to even death. Um, so we really want to make sure we're paying attention to those. Um, further on our assessment, um, so palpation. So we're just like you guys um, that had the opportunity in OB to palpate that little newborn skull, the little squishiness. Um, so we're assessing, um, are those suture lines mobile? Um, sorry, my head, I'm, I'm doing that. I'm squishing your little head. 
Um, we're also assessing their fontanelles. What are we assessing for um, on those fontanelles, the anterior and posterior? What's that? Molding. So we're assessing the molding of the, the, the parts of the skull. Um, but on those fontanelles. Bulging or sunken in. What does that tell me? Bulging in the cranial pressure. Fine uh, dehydration. dehydration. Exactly. So I want to make sure I'm assessing. I'm also assessing are they closed? So one for your study notes. When should I anticipate posterior and anterior fontanelle closures? Um, so also looking at what is that telling me and are they on that normal growth pattern um, of formation and closing? And right there, so posterior fontanelle, usually around two months should be closed and the anterior between 12 to 18 months, um, typically seeing that those are closing. All right, so diagnosis, um, so lab and diagnostic testing, lumbar puncture, we're doing a CSF, doing subarachnoid space, a lot of things we use this information for um, doing our lumbar puncture, punctures. Um, so assisting with positioning, what is our nursing role with this? So assisting with positioning, what does that mean? How do we want to position? Fetal position, especially our little kids. And, and any, except for maybe your adolescent, having them on the sideline, fetal position is probably the easiest and the best because we can control their movements a little bit better than if we had them sitting at the edge of the bed. You can do it that way, but it's a little bit more difficult, as I mentioned, to keep them under control um, and not have it as traumatic. Um, and just like doing that epidural we talked about with the OB patient um, in labor, um, having them on the side, and then getting you know, one arm behind their neck, one behind their knees, and helping them to roll up. One, we open up those spinous processes as much as we can, but we also have them a lot better controlled. So if they feel as they're starting to numb up that area and they wanna jump, you've got them under control a lot better. Um, kind of like that headlock thing. Um, so anyway, it's all about control, right? <laughs> uh, so anyway, so assisting with positioning helping to maintain strict asepsis um, as we're doing that. So you're, you're kind of right there with them. So monitoring their vital signs, not their vital signs, watching that too. Their respiratory status, their level of consciousness, pain level, um, as long as it's not contraindicated, we want to encourage fluids. Or if they aren't able to have oral fluids, making sure they have their IV so that we're maintaining that hydration. Um, Another highlight thing here is keeping them flat for an hour after the procedure, letting the weight of their body help to seal where that spinal tap just took place. What happens if that hole where they just tapped into that um, spinal column, what if it starts to leak? That fluid is leaking. We get headaches and we can be very uncomfortable. Exactly, spinal headaches. If it's a significant hole, if it doesn't seal at all, then we definitely have bigger problems. Um, at that, but the spinal headache. Um, so we definitely want to, as you know, as much as we can, keep them flat um, for that hour. If we have time, using the MO cream for that 30 to 60 seconds, 60 seconds, minutes, um, before the procedure helps to minimize the discomfort um, of that numbing up. Are they laying on their back or on their stomach? You want them on their back because again, you want the pressure of their body on, kind of like a pressure dressing, okay. but their body's putting the pressure on that, so we want them on their back. Yeah. What's the amyloprene? The amyloprene is just a numbing agent. It's like a lidocaine-ish, um, but it helps to numb up the area. Um, I don't know if many of you had experience in, at Children's, they use the cream before starting an IV. Um, we don't always have the time to do that, um, but it is a nice element if we can kind of numb up the site so they don't feel it as much. Did you happen to see the J test that they had as well? I didn't. Um, <clears throat> so at Children's they had, um, it was like a pressurized lidocaine. Um, so it was essentially, right? And so like they would push it on there and it, they called it the rocket ship. So it would um, inject lidocaine, but they couldn't <clears throat> see the needle. So they weren't afraid of it. And then it would numb it and they check the IV. Okay. It's actually a thermal injection with a CO2 power yeah. injector, so there's no needle associated oh. with it. Whoa. Whoa. Like you're coming on the site. I know some adults would benefit yeah. from something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 
It's not ripping it's open. Stinging. No. So it, it just like sprays it on the surface of the skin? It's, it's like a jet stream. stream. It's like a, 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 a sufficient velocity that the pain oh. will actually penetrate. Mm -hmm. yeah. But not the, the pain <coughs> per se of a needle, mm -hmm. the, like you do with our lidocaine. It was almost like the pigs were scared of the noise, but if you said it was a rocket ship, it made every day. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I, I know some adults that lose them when that is. <laughs> All right, all right. So other things, um, head and neck X-rays. When we, whenever possible, let's let the, the parents stay with the child. If we can minimize the fear factor, if we can minimize you know, the anxiety as much as possible, let's do that. Um, with X-rays, we may need to do some temporary restraining. Um, if parents do go in with the with child, make sure they have their lead apron, you know, those kinds of protective equipment. Um, ultrasound, um, we use this for intracranial hemorrhage, um, assessing the ventriculars um, inside the <coughs> ventricles. They tend to tolerate this much better than CT or MRI. Um, CT and MRI, we may have to use somewhat of a sedative just so they can hold still long enough uh, for the procedure to be done. Um, and then in the CT, doing these with and without contrast dyes, making sure we're assessing for any allergies, and then whether oral fluids, if they are able to have them, um, if not, making sure we have an IV started and ensuring that they're um, hydrated. Um, EEG, um, to diagnose seizures, if there's brain death, evaluating brain tumors, um, subdural hematomas and intracranial hemorrhages. With these, with an EEG, again, try to keep the child still. We don't want them to be sedated. So these are um, oftentimes having the parents keep the child awake as long as possible before the procedure, hoping that they will sleep through the procedure um, because we want them to be as still, still as possible. Because the more they're moving around, obviously that's going to change the readings. Um, and our MRIs showing normal versus abnormal brain tissue, so looking for tumors, uh, inflammation, the abnormalities, um, no metals, so if they have metal plates or things like that, um, probably not the smartest thing. Um, we may need to sedate them. This is a very loud, um, confined type of machine. Unless you go like the Pueblo is the closest one to us that has the open MRI, um, it's not quite as frightening um, as some of our other ones. Um, and then again, with or without dye, just like we did with the CT scan. Um, ICP monitoring. Um, so with this, so if we had a, a kid that has um, head trauma or um, increased IC ICP, we may need to be looking at how, what is that pressure regulation? How high are these pressures getting? So using that intraventricular catheter, so dr drilling burr holes, um, there's a lot of different types of things that we can do to monitor the, the pressure in their head. 